This first move occupies the center with a pawn and frees four squares for the queen and five for the f1 bishop. One of the reasons many players prefer 1, e4, to any other opening move is that it gets the kingside pieces rolling quickly, enabling early castling on that side. e5. In the old days this was almost compulsory. It indicated that you were willing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and slug it out. Only a coward would avoid 1, e5, and a possible gambit by white. Objectively considered, the text move is perhaps black's strongest response. It challenges possession of the center and prevents white from monopolizing it by continuing to d4. Knight f3. What happens if white persists and plays to d4? The reply to e takes d4 leads to 3, queen takes d4, knight c6, 4, queen e3, knight f6, when black has two pieces in play to one of whites. This amounts to taking the initiative away from white early in the game. The text move is far more effective than random development of the knight, for instance at h3, where it is out of touch with affairs in the center, or at e2, where it blocks all traffic. Knight c6 The logical way to meet the attack on the pawn, a minor piece develops toward the center and defends the pawn. The general plan of mobilization is to establish a pawn in the center, develop the minor pieces, the knights before bishops, whenever feasible, then castle to get the rooks to the center files, and finally bring the queen out, but not too far from home. Premature development of the queen is dangerous, as it is subject to annoying attacks by pawns and minor pieces. Bishop b5 The most natural move on the board, white strikes at the defender of the pawn he attacks. It is true that he cannot win the pawn at once, as after 4, bishop takes c6, d takes c6, 5, knight takes e5, queen d4, black regains the pawn, but the pressure on black is constant and the threat is always in the air. The Rui Lopez is probably the strongest of all kingside openings. White has more to say in the center, since he will be able to play d4 without much trouble, while black will find it difficult to achieve d5. White's pieces have more room to move around in, while black's game is considerably cramped in many variations. a6 this can become like the story the house that Jack built, the pawn attacks the bishop that attacks the knight that defends the pawn that the knight attacks. Black's purpose is to dislodge the bishop from its favorable position. The loss of time involved in moving a pawn is compensated for by the fact that the threatened bishop must also lose a move in retreating. Bishop a4 This is in the spirit of the opening as it maintains pressure on the knight. The alternative withdrawal to c4 is inferior, as the same position could have arisen after the move 3, bishop c4, except that here black has the additional move, a6, which can only be to his benefit. Knight f6 Black develops a piece, attacks a pawn and prepares early kingside castling. More could hardly be expected of one move. Castle kingside White brings his king to safety and swings the rook over toward the center files. Bishop e7. A favorite continuation with many players is 5, knight takes, e4, not with the idea of winning a pawn, as white regains it easily, but in order to obtain a free, open game. The danger in this line is that it leaves black's position in the center somewhat insecure. The text leads to a more blocked position difficult to break through, but requires patience on black's part. The bishop's development at, e7, is satisfactory even though it has moved only one square away from home. The important thing is that it has left the back rank and facilitated castling. Rook e1. White brings his rook toward the center. In lieu of an open file, the rook prepares to take command of a file liable to be opened. In guarding his own e-pawn, 
white renews the threat of 7, bishop takes c6, d takes c6, 8, knight takes e5, winning a pawn. The rook's move is preferable to developing the b1, knight 2, c3, white may want to provide a retreat for his bishop by c3, guarding it against an exchange. b5. Black meets the threat by forcing the bishop back. Bishop b3. Obviously the only move. d6. Black protects the e-pawn, releases the c8, bishop and prepares 8, knight a5, to remove the troublesome enemy bishop. At first glance it seems illogical to give one bishop freedom while hemming in the other, but since the dark squared bishop does a good job at e7, it remains for the light squared bishop to go out into the world. c3 With two objects. 1. To provide refuge for the bishop against an attempt to remove it by 8, knight a5. 2. To support an advance of the d-pawn, establishing a strong pawn center. Knight a5. Not so much to strike at the bishop as to make way for 9, c5, to dispute control of the central squares. In this line of the Lopez, black's best counterchances lie in action on the queen side. Bishop c2. Naturally, white wants to keep both bishops. He loses a tempo, but it is offset by black's posting of a knight at the side of the board. c5. Black intensifies his pressure on the central square, d4, and provides an egress, as the old books used to say, for the queen. d4. One of the chief objectives in king's pawn openings is to advance the d-pawn to the center as soon as circumstances permit, just as in queen's pawn openings it is desirable to get the e-pawn to e4, when there is an opportunity to do so. White again threatens to win the e-pawn by the double attack on it. Queen c7 Black gives his pawn further support and develops his queen at the same time. It would not do to exchange by 10, e takes d4, 11, c takes d4, c takes d4, 12, knight takes d4, as it surrenders the center and leaves black with an isolated center pawn. An isolated pawn, says Tartakower, casts gloom over the entire chessboard. White would benefit too in that his knight, standing firmly in the center of the board, could not be dislodged by unfriendly pawns h3. To prevent the pin, bishop g4, which might embarrass the knight in the piece it shields, the queen. Both pieces are needed for the protection of the d-pawn and the maintenance of the pawn formation in the center. An exchange of the white knight by, bishop takes f3, and the recapture by the queen, removes at one stroke two supports of the d-pawn. Is white violating principle in moving one of the pawns near his king? Maybe, but one must know when to slight conventions as well as observe them. In this particular situation it is important to prevent an attack on the knight, its subsequent exchange and the breakup of white's pawns in the center. The move of the h-pawn is weakening, but a lesser evil than would result from permitting the pin. But wait a moment. Is it a weakening move if black is unable to benefit by it? Is it detrimental to the position if black cannot exploit it by a kingside attack? The answer is no. A move is weak only if the opponent can turn its imperfections to his advantage. The entire position is strong or weak only in relation to the position of the opponent. In this case, the move of the h-pawn is expedient as it conforms to the requirements of the specific position. Knight c6 the knight returns and adds weight to the pressure on the d-pawn. Black threatens a series of exchanges by 12, e takes d4, 13, c takes d4, c takes d4, resulting in the gain of a pawn, as the further sequence 14, knight takes d4. Knight takes d4, 15, queen takes d4, queen takes c2, would cost white a piece. Black hopes to tempt white into playing 12, d5, 
to meet this threat. This looks good, as it would evict the C6 knight from a good post, but it has the drawback, for white, of releasing the tension in the center, as well as making, d5, unavailable for the use of his pieces. Bishop e3. White is in no hurry. He brings aid to the d-pawn by developing another piece. Castle kingside. Removing the king to safer quarters and pressing the rook into active service. Knight b d2. This knight has been developed where he has little mobility and seems to have no future to speak of, but it is the first step that counts. Little as this is, its consequence is worth emphasizing. The knight's move clears the first rank and enables the major pieces, the queen and the rooks, to get in touch with each other. Get your pieces off the back rank and into active play. Bishop d7. Black does likewise, his bishop vacates the back row to let the rooks come to the center files. The rooks are powerful pieces and must not be shut in. Rook c1. In the early stages of the game, the rooks may not do much but they must be ready for action when it comes. This they best do by placing themselves at the head of open files. If none are available, then they should work on partly open files. If none of those exist, the rooks should still be brought toward the center, as those files are most likely to be opened. But in any case, get the rooks out of the corners. Knight e8. Planning to advance the f pawn. This pawn will dispute the center with white's e pawn while opening the f file for the rook. Knight f1. The knight retreats to gain momentum for a leap to g3, and then f5, a beautiful outpost. g6. Not only to keep the knight out but also to support 16, f5, a thrust at the center. The advance of the g pawn weakens the squares f6, and, h6, as they are no longer guarded by the pawn. This may strike the average player as an interesting but perhaps insignificant point, but recognizing a weakness and knowing how to take advantage of it marks the master player. Good players do not win games by waiting for you to make monumental mistakes. They don't expect you to leave pieces and prize. Bishop h6 White immediately anchors a piece on one of the vulnerable kingside squares. Knight g7. The only move to prevent loss of the exchange by 17, bishop takes f8. Knight e3. The knight comes back into the game by a slightly different route than was planned earlier. Not only does it add to the pressure on d5, but it also threatens to settle down powerfully on that square. Rook a e8. Black could not stop the knight coming in by 17, bishop e6, as 18, d5, in reply wins a piece. He also abandons the contemplated break by 17, f5, as it opens the position, and open lines favor the player whose development is superior and who is better equipped to use these lines in an attack. With his actual move, Black tries to keep a tightly knit defensive position, one that is difficult to break through. Knight d5. A very fine move whose object is more profound than the obvious one of fixing a piece on a strong central square. Queen b7. The queen must flee from the knight's attack. Knight takes, e7 check. This is the point. The knight gives up his good position for a worthy cause. It is important, in order to capitalize on the weakness of the dark square, f6, to remove the guardian of this square, the dark squared bishop on, e7, with this bishop out of the way the weakness is accentuated and white can then consider some means of invading, and then fastening a piece, on the critical square. Rook takes, e7. This is forced, as 19, Knight takes, e7, 20, d takes, e5, d takes, e5, 21, knight takes, e5, costs a pawn. d takes c5. 
The purpose of this exchange is to open a nice long file for the queen. D takes c5. Black must recapture or lose a pawn. Queen d6. Beautiful exploitation of the open d file. The attack on the c pawn gains a tempo toward the queen's entry at f6. c4. Black must lose a move in saving this pawn. Queen f6. With this move, which incidentally threatens instant mate, white fastens another piece in the holes in black's position created by the move, g6, white's advantage is decisive and the winning procedure should be what the books call, a matter of technique. The process of realizing his advantage is an interesting one. Knight h5. Black stops the mate and attempts to drive the queen away. Queen h4. It would be a mistake to play 23, queen g5, as black, instead of moving his threatened rook on, f8, would first play 23, f6, banishing the queen completely from his premises. Knight g7. The knight blocks the bishop's attack on the rook and is prepared to counter 24, queen f6, by 24, knight h5, repeating the device of harassing the enemy queen. How does white continue, to force a win? Bishop e3. By rearranging his pieces and bringing up the reserves. This first move in the new formation gains time by the threat of 25, bishop c5, winning the exchange. Knight e6. The only way to prevent 25, bishop c5, after which white completely dominates the dark squares. Queen f6. Once more into the breach. Black cannot save the game by repeating moves, since after 25, knight g7, 26, bishop c5, rook e6, or 26, knight h5, 27, queen h4, and white wins the exchange. 27, queen h4, rook f e8, 28, knight g5, the threat of mate will win the rook at e6. Queen c7. Black must hang on to the valuable e pawn. Bishop h6. Once again white has his ideal position, with pieces firmly planted in the holes near black's king. It will be hard for black to chase them off as he does not have the earlier resource of, knight h5. Rook c8. The rook must flee the bishop's attack. Interposing the knight instead is of course a blunder as mate follows instantaneously. Rook c d1. Before proceeding to the final attack, white gets a stronger grip on the position by seizing the open d-file. The next step, since black must wait helplessly, is 28, rook d5, attacking the e-pawn a third time and threatening to double rooks on the file. This ought to be enough to beat down resistance if no quicker win is available. Note that white has not embarked on dubious long-range combinations. His plan, in most cases aimed at increasing his positional superiority, is made for a few moves only. Don't believe all those stories you hear of chess masters analyzing intricate combinations with dozens of variations for 30 moves ahead. They don't do this because they don't have to. It is far easier and more to the point to look only a few moves ahead and try to maintain at least an equal game at every stage. Winning by accumulating small advantages is more consistent with a common sense approach than to seek to overwhelm the opponent with bewildering combinations and venturesome sacrificial attacks. Strengthening one's own position gradually while undermining that of the opponent is more important than indulging in fruitless speculative fancies. Rook e e8. Black's idea is to reduce the pressure by offering an exchange of queens. White will then either have to acquiesce to the exchange, or withdraw his queen. Knight h2. A very fine move. The knight, which seemed well posted at, f3, is rerouted to augment the pressure on the dark squares. 
Queen d8. Continuing the plan of evicting White's queen from his camp. Knight g4. White supports his queen and is ready, in the event of an exchange of queens, to maintain a tight grip on the dark squares. If black plays 29, queen takes f6, then 30, knight takes f6 check, king h8, 31, rook takes d7, wins a piece for white. Queen e7. This does not help, but there is no way to save the game, if 29, rook e7, then 30, bishop e3, threatening 31, knight h6 check, king f8, 32, queen h8 checkmate, 30, rook e8, 31, knight h6 check, king f8, 32, queen takes f7 checkmate. Queen takes, e7. The simplest. If no mate is in sight, the modern master dispenses with the fireworks. Dawdling is for dilettantes, so he simplifies and cuts down any chance of resistance. After 30, rook takes, e7, 31, knight f6 check, king h8, 32, rook takes d7, white wins a piece, giving black no opportunity to complicate the ending. 